It's my turn. Is that right? <laughs> Amen. Well, we thank God for this uh, moment. We thank God. For, we thank God for each of you who are joining us tonight uh, on this call. Uh, thank you, Reverend Jones, for this opportunity. And to my sister, uh, Reverend Camilla Bradley, who thought it not robbery to uh, go through her phone and find my name to uh, see if I was available for this revival. Uh, to my, my, my bride who was on the line, uh, give God praise for her. And I scrolled through and I saw some, some family on here. Uh, my sister from way back, Katora, and my sister, uh, the Dr. Dewana. Uh, Patton, and I know if she's on the line, then everybody in the house is on the line. So hello to the Patton Duncan family uh, for being present on tonight. Uh, gracious God, we thank you now, and we just ask that you speak to us through your word. Uh, anoint these lips of clay, hide me behind your cross, and cover me with your precious blood. That no flesh will glory in your sight. This we pray in your Son Jesus' name. Uh, amen. Don't want to prolong the time. Uh, I want to call your attention to the book of Revelation, chapter 3. The book of Revelation, uh, chapter 3. It should not be a difficult book to find if you just scroll to the very last book of the Bible, your sacred text. Uh, you should be right there at it, Revelation, chapter 3. <laughs> uh, and I want to read two verses of scripture, uh, beginning with verse 1. Uh, to this church in Sardis. Uh, verse 1 says, To the angel of the church in Sardis write, reading from the New NIV, uh, the New International Version, To the angel of the church in Sardis write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Verse 2 says, Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God stands forever. <clears throat> As I watched and listened to President Joe Biden deliver his State of the Union address to the nation, let me say that uh, I am not speaking tonight in official capacity as a chaplain of the Air Force. I'm here as an elder of the church. Um, but as I watched and listened to President Joe Biden deliver his State of the Union address to the nation, it occurred to me 40 minutes into his speech that he kept repeating this phrase, let's finish the job. Uh, he highlighted the big corporations in America making 40 billion and profit and paid zero in federal income taxes and with his new law they will have to pay a minimum of 15 percent which is less than a nurse's pay he went on to say that there's more to do as we should reward work and not just wealth uh, he said let's finish the job as he spoke to the issue of Big Pharma and the cost of insulin decreasing for seniors on Medicare, he said, let's finish the job, making the same costs available to millions of other Americans who are not on Medicare, including 200,000 young people with type 1 diabetes who need insulin to save their lives. Addressing the climate crisis and its existential threat, he said, we have an obligation to our children and grandchildren to confront it. He says we will finish the job. Uh, in acknowledgement of the death of the late Tyree Nichols and other people of color who have died by the hands of law enforcement, there was a call to come together, speaking truth to power in that he has not had to have the talk with his children that our parents had to have with us. He said, let's finish the job on police reform. My brothers and sisters, while this is not meant to be a political message, it's without question that we have work to do. And this is the call to get the house in order. What an indictment on the church, 
when the Lord himself, the righteous judge, speaks out against his bride. For thought tonight, I want to talk. I want to talk in the thought tonight. Wake up and finish the work. Wake up and finish the work. John, who is the servant that received the revelations of Christ, exiled to the Isle of Patmos for preaching the word of God and for his testimony about Jesus, fully reports everything he saw in this book. Looking back at the first century church, one may ask how they remained faithful to God when faced with fierce persecution and even death. Might I tell you the answer is simple. They remained faithful because of hope. Edward Mote, a British pastor and hymn writer, once spoke of being left to his own devices as a child and said later in life, so ignorant was I that I did not know that there was a God. But when he met the Lord for himself, he later penned these words. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Y'all say it with me, on Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking, is sinking sand. Though the world around them was hostile and often appeared to be winning the battle, these Christians could stand firm because they knew the end of the story. The psalmist told us with God on our side, we will win. Watch this because we too know the end of the story. The first three chapters of Revelations are written as letters to various churches in Asia Minor, warning them about the, their specific shortcomings. To the church at Ephesus, the Lord says, I know all the things you do. For I have seen the work and endurance, but I have a complaint against you because you don't love me or each other the way you did at first. So he says, turn back and do what you did first and repent. And, and, and as I read this, I, I, I recall my own wife telling me, I, I, I don't do what I used to do. <laughs> so every now and then we got to go back and love God the way we used to love him. But in spite of God saying that he had this against them, he also comes back and says, but this is in your favor. He says, you hate the evil deeds of the Nicolaitans just as I do. To the church at Smyrna, the Lord says, I know about your suffering and poverty, but you are rich. And I know about the blasphemy of those opposing you. But even though I know about your suffering and your poverty and the blaspheme of those opposing you, I want you to not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. Yes, I know you're suffering. Yes, I know you're in poverty, but there's more suffering on the way. So hold on. And if you remain faithful, even when facing death, the Lord says, I will give you the crown of life. To the church at Pergamum, the Lord says, I know where you live and who sits on the throne referring to Satan. Yet you remain loyal to me. And even in the midst of your loyalty to me, I have a few complaints against you. He says you tolerate teaching that is, that is like that of Balaam who showed Balak how to trip up the people of Israel. Teaching them to sin by eating what was offered to idols and committing sexual sin. The Lord says repent of your sin or I'll come to you suddenly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. To the church at thy tower, the Lord says, I know all the things you do, but I have a complaint against you. For you permitted Jezebel to lead my servants astray. I even gave her time to repent, but she does not want to turn from her immorality. But I have a message for those who have not followed the false teaching. The Lord says to them, hold tightly to what you have until I come. And to all who are victorious and obey until the very end, to them I will give authority over all the nations ruling with an iron rod and smashing them like clay pots. The text says, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And then now tonight we come to our text, Revelation chapter 3 verses 1 and 2, where he is talking now to the church 
in Sardis. Verse 1 says to the angel of the church in Sardis, write, these are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. He says, I know your deeds. You have a reputation. You have a reputation. You have a reputation of being alive. Why don't you look at your neighbor on the Zoom and say, but you are dead. Yeah, I know you, people think you're alive, but, but you're dead. You're walking around dead with the reputation of being alive. The ancient city of Sardis had seen its best days and has had started to decline. Yet it was a wealthy city situated at the junction of several important roads and trade routes. It was no secret that there was a connection between Sardis and easy money. Sardis being the place where our modern day money was born was also a city well known for its softness and luxury. It had a well-deserved reputation for apathy and immorality. The combination of easy money and a loose moral environment made the people of Sardis notoriously soft and pleasure loving. This softness, this lack of discipline and dedication was the doom of Sardis on a few different occasions. In the days of Cyrus, the city of Sardis was ideally suited for defense and there seemed to be no way to scale the steep cliff walls surrounding the city. The king offered a reward to any soldier in his army who could figure out how to get up the city wall. One of the king's soldiers studied the situation carefully and noticed a soldier of Sardis drop his helmet down the cliff walls and watched him climb down a hidden trail to recover his fallen gear. The location was marked and that night a detachment of the king's troops went up the cliff to the city walls. And when they reached the city walls, they found the soldiers of Sardis unguarded. These men were so confident in their natural defenses of their city that they felt no need to keep a diligent watch. And might I say that the enemy sees us unguarded, so confident, cocky, and complacent in the things of the spirit that we don't keep a diligent watch? We were told in John 10.10 10, that the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. And after, even after being out of church, out of the church building for two and a half years, some of us are no more closer to God than we were before. And some have, have even drifted farther away. We don't pray like we should. We're more fo focused on the discrepancies of the organization rather than living authentically within the organism. The foolery that happens within the walls of the ecclesia is now broadcasted on social media. And every word that is spoken is not from God and every praise break is not because the spirit is moving. We are unguarded, overconfident in the way we do church. That many do not seek a pure and authentic relationship with God. Therefore, we cannot encounter a fresh move of God. I think I want to say that one more time. We are unguarded and overconfident in the way we do church. That many do not seek a pure and authentic relationship with God. Therefore, we cannot encounter a fresh move of God. Verse 1 to the angel of the church in Sardis write. These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Jesus describes himself to the church using terms that emphasize his character as the master of every spiritual power and authority. The repetition of the number seven is our reminder that in him is the fullness of the spirit of God and the fullness of the church. For the number seven represents completeness. He says, I know your deeds. The King James says, I know your works. In other words, what a church is and what a church does is never hidden from Jesus. You might think you're getting away with what you're doing in the dark. But Proverbs 15, 3 says, but the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. 
And not only do I know your deeds, but I also know that you have a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. Your reputation is one of life and vitality. Online Bible studies every night, several committees, several viewers and followers on your social media platforms, excelling in promotions and publicity. I want to come to your church because there's always something going on. But Jesus said, I know you have a reputation of being alive, but the truth of the matter is you're dead because I see you for what you really are. In other words, a good reputation is no guarantee of true spiritual character despite one's good appearance. A lot of church folks are dressed up on the outside, but on the inside, there is no life. I often heard it said people know when you are ingenuine, well, I heard it said another way, but I'm going to say it that way tonight. Regardless to how you're dressed on the outside, you talk a good game, but lack substance. When something or someone is dead, there's no indication of struggle, no fight, no persecution. For that which is dead can't lose the battle because it's lost the battle. In this letter, Jesus didn't encourage the Christians in Sardis to stand strong against persecution or false doctrine because being dead presented no significant threat to Satan's domain. And might I say if everything in your life is rosy, that might be an indication that something is dead in you. Now no one likes to be persecuted, but I was told a long time ago that trials come to make us strong. Verse 1 says to the angel of the church in Sardis, write these are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. But verse 2 says, wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die. I hope you all caught that. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Just because one might be dead on the inside, I want you to know tonight you're still connected to life. Wake up, you who are asleep. Wake up, you who are complacent, drown, downtrodden, and brokenhearted. Wake up, you who are known to be the life of the party with access to wealth and resources. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. Examine and protect what you have. Though your spiritual condition is bad, it's not hopeless. For you still have life. Jesus says, but I have come that they might have life. And that they might have it more abundantly. Yes, there are deficiencies with you spiritually. But the Lord says, I can work with what you got. Strengthen what remains that's at the point of death. At the point of death because there's an opportunity to finish the work. Get out of the habit of starting something and not completing it. Why don't you allow God this year to complete his work in you. You put on airs long enough. Wake up and strengthen what you got left. Somebody might be saying, but life is closing in on me and I have to pretend to be alive knowing that I'm dead. It's something to know that you're dead. You have to pretend to be alive. I want to say to you tonight, wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. I don't know about you. I don't want to lose nothing that God has for me because I'm putting energy into a reputation of being alive when I know that I'm dead. It's time out for playing church. It's time to be real. It's time to be revived. And it's time to wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. My brothers and sisters, we've got work to do. And it's my prayer that we wake up and finish the work. And somebody may be asking, how do I finish the work? What do I do once I've awakened? Well, the answer is simple. And it's found in verse 3. The Lord says, remember. <laughs> remember what you have received and heard. Hold it fast. And don't just hold it fast, but repent. <laughs> repent for the kingdom of God 
is at hand. James 1 and 12 says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Why don't you encourage those who are next to you and say, wake up and finish the work. Gracious and all wise God, we thank you tonight for what our eyes have seen and what our ears have heard. Lord, help us wake up and, and finish that which you have committed to our hand. We thank you for the opportunity to hear what thus saith the Lord. And God, as we prepare to end this call and end this message, that we put into practice what we heard on tonight. We thank you and we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.